And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a technically newcomer into the temple. <clears throat> Coming... Coming to us from Galaxy's Edge and the head honcho of the role-playing version of Forgotten Ruin, the one and only Walt Robillard. I'm hoping I got pronunciation right. <laughs> You're actually one of the few people who pronounces it the same way I do, although uh, my dad used to pronounce it with the whole French thing going on, and uh, everybody else seems to like it that way. So they, <laughs> they, they usually butcher either that way or in some... Uh, other fashion or function, but I appreciate you having me on. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming on. Uh, I am somebody who will who will call who will call a certain execution device a guillotine specifically to piss off francophone friends of mine. <laughs> it's true, and, and it's weird because like my um, uh, my dad is originally from Corsica, and my mom is from Sicily, so. Um, uh, yeah, it, it, my my particular last name was never uh, nobody really cared <laughs> because I wasn't Italian enough and my dad wasn't really around. So it was like it was like, yeah, well, who cares how you say it? <laughs> yeah. Oh. For me, for me with mine, I just I just have a bunch of people assuming that there's some fancy ass way to do it when there really isn't. Yeah. Yeah, that happens. <laughs> Although I have had people ask me if I'm related to Mirko Krokop. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I, I wish I could kick as hard as he could. Right. Uh, well, I've been doing martial arts for forty, God, forty-two years now, mm -hmm. and uh, nowadays my kicking is not as strong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's all good in the hood. Yeah. But I'd like to start with the humble beginnings. Sure. So, walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games, and then we'll lean into how you first discovered the book series known as Forgotten Ruin. So um, uh, I started uh, kind of like junior high school, and a guy was sitting next to me in homeroom, and he had uh, he had one of the books, and I was like, I, I loved the covers. Um, they, they had those, those easily covers, and I was just like, oh my god, that is gorgeous. And he's like, I said, is it a story? And I said, because... Um, uh, Lord of the Rings had helped me to teach, uh, help me to learn English. Mm -hmm. And he was like, he's like, well, no, it's a, it's, it's a game. And I'm like, wow, that's a huge is if that's rules, that's a big rule book. He's like, no, not really. He goes here, here, take them, borrow them. And after that, I was hooked. <laughs> I was like, you know, you 13 year old kid and, uh, you know, and you were just you know, trying to figure out your place in the world. And suddenly now you have co something in common with somebody else and, and it's an easy, you know, an easy in. So many, many days over um, my friends munching on pizza and me having to abstain because I was a wrestler. <laughs> mm -hmm. So everybody else was was, you know, chowing down and, and rolling dice. And I'm just rolling dice and drinking water because I was always trying to make weight. Mm -hmm. Um but um, as far as getting into Forgotten Ruin, um, I had first gotten into um, the, the two authors, Jason Onspach and Nick Cole, had written Galaxy's Edge, which um, I am not a big fan of, of uh, how things have gone since Disney has taken over the franchise. So, you know, I was, I was scrolling around through Facebook, uh, talking to some friends of mine who uh, were deployed at the time, and I saw the ad for the first book, Legionnaire, and the art, once again, the art was mind-numbing. I'm like, yes, I don't know what this is, but I have to read it. Mm -hmm. And uh, they captured me with the first line of the book, and I was like, oh my god. So I read all nine books in the first series, the three books in the, what I, and, uh, in the side series at the time, then they launched another side series with three books, and mm -hmm. I'm just like, Th these guys are awesome so i reached out and blah 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 and i said hey look um uh you you have a lot of cool details uh correct in here so either you're talking to somebody military or you're um you have military people on staff but you know if you ever, if you ever need like uh you know some more technical details um i served in the military for quite a long time i can help you out mm -hmm. and they reached out 
Uh, and that's the great thing about Jason and Nick. They love their fans, love their fans. And uh, so they reached out and they said, Hey, here's the deal. Uh, you know, why don't you, um, why don't you get on a phone call with us? <laughs> like, Holy crap. These are guys selling, you know, like, like a million dollars in books in a year or something like that. And, you know, they're just going to take time out of the day to talk to me because I was a fan, mm-hmm. you know? So, um, and then what ended up happening was, uh, as things kind of went on and, and went on, I, I started the galaxy's edge podcast. Mm-hmm. to kind of celebrate the book series and, you know, really enjoyed that. And, um, uh, you know, at one point they said, Hey, look, um, we're going to be doing this new thing called forgotten ruin picture, um, Lord of the Rings, uh, the battle of Helm's deep, but, um, the good guys have stumbled into an entire company of United States army Rangers with all their gear. Mm-hmm. I'm like, I don't know what this is, but I need it in my life. <laughs> <laughs> so um, they were like, dude, do you want to do, be a technical advisor on it? And I said, uh, yeah, that'd be great. So it was me, uh, this guy, Chris, uh, this other guy, Dave. Uh, we were the technical advisors in the book. And eventually um, I had just written a trilogy of my own. And uh, they were like, hey, bro, um, why don't you come work for us? <laughs> so I was like... You don't have to threaten me with a good time. Uh, <laughs> I'm all about it. So, and that's how I got uh, Forgotten Ruin. Um, mm-hmm. The books are amazing. If you haven't read them, um, the whole series is told from the point of view of a. Uh, it's told from the point of view of a translator they bring along, mm-hmm. um, and it's just it's just fan- fantastic, fantastic. Like shut off your brain and just and just you know, rock a really good book full of action. And, uh, you know, that, uh, that thing that we all love where somebody in an alien environment, um, somebody in an alien environment has to adjust to that environment to, Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, kind of, uh, uh, become what they need to become in order to survive it. So Mm -hmm. yeah, definitely cool story. And that whole idea, that whole idea of, Adju- of adjusting to a new environment is something that certainly certainly appeals to me and cuz cuz well for starters I'm in, I'm all the way out in Minnesota and you ha- and you have to have a bit of a respect for for the for the forests and as well as for just mother nature cuz mother nature is on the drugs yes <laughs> uh but one of my f- one one book about one book about survival in a wilderness that I remember very fondly at a young age was Hatchet by the late Gary Paulson, who passed away right last on. year. Um, and in that in that case, it was just having to survive in the in the in the wilderness of I think British Columbia, either British Columbia or closer to Alaska, um, with nothing but a hatchet. That uh, sounds like my jam. Um, and. It is it is written in a very in a very '90s young adult kind of way. They tried to make it into a, into a made-for-TV movie, but it's a made-for-TV movie, so you can kind of figure out how that went. Yeah, they didn't show anything good. <laughs> it was it wasn't very good. Um, but th- I remember I remember doing a bit of research on Forgotten Ruin and just what just what it ha- just what it has to offer. And I'm, if I'm being honest, I would pay good money to see. To see some adaptation through graphic audio, if you're familiar with them. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, if only be, if only because I, w- I want to see more. I want to see more of that in the in st- instead of um, instead of just audiobook. There's a lot, right a on. lot of audiobooks. They don't have they don't have any scoring. And never underestimate how effective a good score um. Good, mu- good music can go with that in order to paint the scene. Oh, absolutely, Jaws. Um, you know the Superman movies from back in the day. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, just, just the, you know, those scores have have gone on to be like so epic. I mean, and who doesn't who doesn't know like the Imperial March? Yeah. You know? um, as ba- as bad as the prequels were, I have I I defy anyone to say a bad thing about Duel of the Fates. Duel of Fates, right? I mean, even to this day, like people who barely even watched it, they know what that is. Um, I also um, I doubt I doubt a lot of I doubt a lot of Bungie's video games would would have been as iconic as they've been without the without um 
the score. Oh, that epic Halo score with the with the acapella in the middle. Oh my god! Oh, um, to the point where there's a video that I that came across a month ago of a bunch of Gregorian monks doing the theme in an old church. That must have sounded epic. Yeah, it did. It did. Um, uh, but now from what I find, what I find interesting is with the Forgotten Ruin RPG, you're you're attempting to account for di- for different styles of old school, um, whether it be what whether it be white box or whether whether it be the more white box leaning swords and wizardry, or some of the other angles that go from that go for things like ascending AC. Um, how easy or difficult was it to balance between those di- between those different styles? It's not too bad. Uh, most of the swords and wizardry stuff is is forwards and backwards compatible. Mm-hmm. If you open a swords and wizardry book, um, each book has the ascending and descending uh, AC in them. Mm-hmm. So you really don't ha- you're not really struggling to to try and find a balance or, or trying to adapt stuff. Um, it works. It, it worked very well. Um, the, one of the guys that did a lot of the groundwork was um, James Michael Spawn in. Uh, uh, it's a game called White Star, where mm-hmm. basically they took um, Swords of Wizardry White Box, they filed off the serial numbers to Star Wars, and then mashed it all together. Uh, great game, amazing game. I love it. Um, mm-hmm. Mostly because t- these days, because uh, uh, I'm writing and editing so much, uh, I don't have the time for an involved game where I have to basically uh, take a college course to put together a game for you know a two, three, four hour session. Yeah. You know, I don't don't have that kind of time. And that's why we went with the uh, the standard version of the game as a Swords and Wizardry white box. So um, another gentleman, not related to uh, um, not related to James, but Peter Spawn put together something called Operation White Box. Mm-hmm. And that was uh, the same kind of rules, but set in World War Two. And then later on, um, a company I do a lot of business with, um, Feigning Goat Games, they came up and they said, hey, look, we want to do a ranger supplement for this. We know you and your business partner have a lot of uh, experience with uh, special operations forces and uh, working in and around that community. Would you make sure it's legitimate for us? Mm -hmm. So what they did was they created an add-on for the Swords and Wizardry White Box, uh, Operation White Box, with World War II, and they adapted it to modern units, and um, uh, uh, basically, you know, brought that whole um, World War II style of play, but with the with the simplicity of not needing once again like an entire college course to set together a uh, um, a four hour gaming session. No, and this is Phoenix Command. <laughs> you know, oh my God! Yeah, do <laughs> you remember the tables in that thing? Jeez. I still. <laughs> There, there. I have I have had to deal with people who who talk who talk about some some more modern games being too complicated. And I said, if you Try say that Phoenix to me again Command. with a straight face, I will find my copy of Phoenix Command and I will beat you with it. And I mean, you know, you looked at the Phoenix Command. For those who don't know, was not really a role playing game. It was a role playing addition to modern games like Recon and um, you know things like that. And the whole idea was to make bullet damage uh, believable at the table, but the tables that were involved in the game, and like when you got the box, I still remember that black box with like the fiery, uh, you know, gun battle going on in the front. And it was this little um, eight and a half by 11 spiral bound book. And basically it was broken down by caliber. Mm Mm-hmm. And it was it was tremendous. I mean, we we tried to play it a couple of times. It was just unplayable. But um, I mostly it, know Phoenix Command because that was the system that was used for the Aliens Adventure game, and both of them have been my whipping boys for years. <laughs> In terms of how not, I'm not I'm not opposed to doing complexity, but there comes a point where you cross the threshold into being masturbatory. Yeah, yeah, and I mean the thing is. No, um, you know, like I came up uh, while while I was in the army. One of my friends uh, exposed me to Champions, and I love that game system. I mm-hmm. think it's I think it's tremendous. Um, the thing I don't like about it is how long everything takes. 
you know so like um you know uh six seconds of combat takes uh anywhere between two to three hours to play through yeah. you know and it's just like uh you know the story isn't advancing this is this is just too complex because what you were constantly doing is you were constantly counting large portions of dice but you were also um constantly referencing back to a rule book mm -hmm. which once again most swords and wizardry books um with the spell descriptions uh, and monster descriptions, everything all in a single book, usually no more than 100, 150 pages. And that's what we wanted because we knew that a lot of our um, our audience for Forgotten Ruin, they were not, they might not have been gamers. So we were like, let's take the easiest version of D&D &D that you can learn um, with characters that can be put together in eight minutes and give this to people so that they can just sit down and enjoy the game. And if they want something more complex, there's rules in the in the game that we put together to make it so. So yeah. I mean, and when I when I refer to when I refer to too much detail being masturbatory, I'm, I'm more referring to the to uh, the fact that for most people, it isn't get, it isn't going to be that important to fi to figure out how much more or less damage a a shot from a nine mil or a ten or a ten mil is go is going to be right. Um, just all all that matters is your get your getting hit. Yes, oh. and uh, recently for like Dungeons and Dr Dragons style games, um, there's a guy on YouTube. Um, I think he's got like a Patreon too, and uh, he's like uh, he calls himself the Dungeon Professor, mm -hmm. um, and he just he just rocked it out of the park because uh he basically detailed for people who are struggling with things like fifth edition dungeons and dragons because of how um complex it has a tendency to be at higher levels um he just did a fantastic video of look this is an easy way to break down your hit points so you're not playing with hit points you're more playing with wounds mm -hmm. uh which um brings us back to uh the old star wars uh, west end games uh, RPG mm -hmm. where they did pretty much the same thing. And um, what it does is it speeds up play um, and removes a lot of the complexity so that you're not constantly, you know, uh, give, giving that, oh, wow, you hit, you did three points of damage. He hits you, you did four points of damage. And you look down at the character sheet for either, the, you know, the adversary or the, uh, or the person who's taken the damage. And you look, you got like 150 hit points and you're just like, I am going to be here all day, you know, and it's just, it's discouraging, but when things go fast and quick, which is why we liked the white box, because um, hit points typically are generated uh, with a D6 only. Um, so like a ninth level character is going to have no more than 54 hit points. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, we have a uh, uh, kind of like a tool in the game. Uh, we, we jokingly call the selector lever. And uh, just like the selector lever on a, uh, a multifunction rifle, you can adjust the lethality uh, to suit your, your gameplay style. Like, for example, uh, we did a play test, uh, God, two months ago. And the, uh, the people who were playing were like, yeah, we want it gritty. We want it very deadly. Hmm. And I'm like, well, luckily, you know, characters only take eight minutes to roll up. So... Um, uh, they, they were third level characters. I think the highest amount of hit points in the party were um, uh, was just about 20 hit points. Um, and then what ended up happening was they wanted the gritty damage. So the damages for all the weapons are higher than just a D6 or 2D6. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, a couple of them got mollywhomped really, really, really bad. It was it was pretty funny because like in the first minute, one guy took an arrow to the chest and like wiped out half of his hit points, and he was just like, "Oh my god!" I said, "Yeah, you better find cover because uh, yeah, just running around uh, you know like pulling the trigger isn't going to work." Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, suddenly uh, a game of I'm a superhero and I'm a half elf, half soy latte uh, fighter, magic user, uh, car mechanic, aircraft technician that can, you know, it's just like, you don't got that. You're not going to be standing in the gap like I can take a hit. You're going to be like, I need to find cover. So um, it's much more um, 
tactical experience than, than just the standard uh, games that are out there now. Uh, and uh, it was funny to see how fast and how quickly people adapted to that and started using things like terrain to their advantage or uh, suppressive fire, which is a, a, a big part of the game. So, yeah, it was pretty wild. Yeah. Now, obvious, obviously... Oh, you're muted, sir. Oh, God. God damn it, not again. Yeah, I'm still there. <laughs> yeah, I'm still here. <laughs> I don't know what happened on that front, but now obviously not ev not everybody who's going to be picking this up is going to have a service background. That's yep. just that's just the nature of the beast. Yes. And I've I've asked this to I've asked this with other people who've de who've developed games who have that who have that experience, but how are, but when it comes to rep when it comes to representing representing tactics and the like for for both the GM and for the players do you plan on having some some segments to adv to advise on both ends well we put a good chunk of that into the uh, into the playtest document mm -hmm. um, uh, and it tells people look um, you know uh, you are not a superhero uh, and that's the big thing about uh, military style games uh, because, you know, you have stuff like uh, like all these shows on the streaming services, you know, uh, you know, where Tom Cruise is, you know, battling uh, a, a horde of enemies and, uh, you know, he's not taking a single scratch. Well, the game is is there to reflect how a military unit would take on a fantasy element like a horde of orcs or a griffin or a hydra. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so the I so those mechanics of how that mindset would tackle things are into the rules. Uh, like for example, we were talking about suppressing fire earlier, right? So it says in the in the rules under that section, um, if you have a an advancing horde coming at you, um, suppressing fire is going to be your best option, and this is how it works. And basically, the idea is it's it works in the game mechanics. It works almost like a breath weapon. Um, so anybody who enters that area that is protected by suppressive fire is going to continue to take damage as long as they're there and not behind cover. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, stuff like that is baked into the rules so that you really don't need that military background. You just need to understand what the rules tells you. Like, if you're standing out in the open, your armor class is what your armor class is. So depending on what armor you're wearing, um, that's all you get. However, if you take, like, cover behind a tree and it kind of covers you a little bit you're going to get this bonus mm -hmm. if you are completely hidden by something that will withstand damage um like say standing behind a tank mm -hmm. it doesn't matter how many arrows the orc horde uh throws at you or even if they use something uh like crazy like a ballista like a big giant siege engine catapult that bolt is going to hit that tank and explode and do nothing um so hiding behind it, you're completely protected until you need to turn around, shoot, and then come back. So uh, all that stuff is baked into the rules. Um, you know, for uh, we uh, in the completed book, we have like a small, um, we have like a small, uh, almost like a bibliography. Like, hey, if you want some ideas on how military units act, this is a cool. Uh, this is a cool thing to look at. If you want to check out orcs and how they typically act, this is a cool thing to look at. So, mm -hmm. you know, that stuff allows guys who um, who have zero military experience um, and might not have watched something uh, more than, uh, say, Saving Private Ryan. It gives them a leg up so that they don't have to feel like, well, I really don't get it. Because, I mean, if you think about it, um, um, how many D&D &D books uh, have you read where they talk about walking into walking in back alleys in the center of town um, because like back in the day in um, in medieval and pre-renaissance times uh, people used to have chamber pots they'd go to the bathroom in their in their house and then throw it out the window mm -hmm. you know I mean there's not usually rules for that in a D and d book so how do you know to do it well I mean if it, if you if it's not integral to the story, then you don't do it. And it's the same thing with the tactics. Mm -hmm. You know, if you if it's not integral to the story, you're not going to do it. But yet in those very sections where it talks about combat, it's like, hey, do you not want to get hit? 
hide behind something, you mm-hmm. know, and that describes pretty much in a nutshell the uh, the basis of most mi- military tactics. Yeah. Now, one thing that I did one th- I one thing that I did appreciate is the uh, cla- is the class lists. Be- if on- if only so that you get because it's good to not fall into the trap of have of having one class be the weapons guy which is a which is a common trap i see in a lot of games right um i've never been i've never been a fan of the concept of the fighter or fighting man because that's way too broad of an archetype right um that and the whole the whole you can wield any kind of weapon isn't re- is doesn't have as much of an impact when most people are going to stick to a particular set set or even just a single style of equipment if someone's going to be if someone's playing fighter in there and they start out with sword and board you're not going to see right. them pick up a javelin or a bow, or a bow and arrow or the like they're going to largely stick with sword and board exactly and i'd like to i'd like to do a bit of a rundown for the audience of the of the classes so i'd like to i'll give you the name of each of each so of each so far that was in the nco document and i Great. I'd like you to just give a just give a gist of what its particular sandbox would be. Uh, so, like, you want me to link it to, say, uh, something like Dungeons and Dragons? Um, if you want a more, it's more about what their particular play style would be and what they're going to bring to the table. Gotcha. Hit me. All right, we'll start with Combat Engineer. All right, this is going to be your. Um, this is going to be the guy that. Uh, Builds your defenses and um, also the ability to sabotage your enemies. Mm-hmm. So, if you had to relate it to a D and D class, the combat engineer is like a combination artificer and thief. All right. Um, yeah. So, yeah, uh, um, they are also usually heavily uh, instructed in explosives. So, um, for the purpose of demolition. Mm-hmm. So, like, um, if there's a bridge you got to destroy, this is the guy. If there's a wall you got to get through, and uh, there's no way to pick a lock, this is your dude. Just remember, a wall is just a door with a different kind of key. You are correct, sir. <laughs> <laughs> um, combat medic. This is your. Uh, if you were a D and D, this is your cleric. Mm-hmm. Um, the combat medic is representative of the uh, the medic in the army or the corpsman. In the Marine Corps, which is usually uh, um, the Marine Corps doesn't have their own medics; uh, they they use uh, Navy medics. Mm-hmm. So um, this is your your healer. But the thing that most people don't realize is um, these guys still carry firearms. These guys still carry weapons. And if they're in an operational unit such as uh, 75th Ranger Regiment, uh, MARSOC, or uh, the Force Reconnaissance Battalions with the Marines, if they're with uh, uh, the Navy SEALs, these guys run rifles just like everybody else. They have to shoot like everybody else, but their primary goal is to bring you back from the brink. Mm -hmm. So next would be the Sniper. Right. Sniper. Pretty much everybody knows what that is. Um, <clears throat> often referred to as LDMs, LDRs, um, uh, sometimes um, uh, DRMs mm-hmm. uh, or DMRs rather. Um, so um, these guys are your long range uh, hitters uh, in a fantasy element. These would be your like long range archers. Mm-hmm. Um uh, the, uh, the great thing about the sniper is, um, their ability not only to, um, to reach out and really punch someone, but also their ability to keep you from being ambushed. Mm-hmm. Um, these guys are, are, um, uh, basically like the, the world's greatest hide and go seek champions. Mm-hmm. So they, um, they will typically know when somebody is around or see signs of it and, uh, be able to kind of, uh, work through that. Yeah. Um, uh, state liaison. So uh, there's a there's a joke in the uh, in the communities that uh, a lot of this book represents. We like to call these guys your alphabet soup dudes, um, or, or like uh, uh, you know they're the uh, the lettered uh, they're the letters in your in your cereal bowl. You know mm-hmm. your your little oats that make letters. So um, the state liaison is like the guy from the CIA. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, or like uh, the diplomatic security service, like all these guys, Mm -hmm. they're basically um, they're there to like smooth things out with the locals. uh, But don't discount them as running a rifle either, because a lot of these guys 
um, they they have to live and work beside locals who want them dead. Mm-hmm. So there will be times where they have to run a rifle as well. But their primary purpose, uh, if you had to relate these guys to say um, somebody who's a uh, like a Dungeons and Dragons guy, this would be your bard, diplomancer. Diplomancer, it is. <laughs> uh trooper. So the trooper would be like your fighter in D and D, but um, the benefit of a trooper is that they're um, this. This is patterned after the infantrymen of both mm-hmm. the army and the Marine Corps. Uh, this could be your security element in the Air Force, or your um, uh, there's a, a group of people in the Navy. Uh, they do vehicle boarding. That, mm-hmm. that be the same thing, um, and their benefit is um, bringing a tactical advantage to your uh to whatever team you make of adventurers Mm -hmm. Uh, because uh not only do they um are they experts in in kind of combat but also they have a tendency to uh to lead so they'll um they give bonuses if you start working together Mm -hmm. um operator so this is where you start getting into the special operations groups Mm -hmm. within the game um, so these start at third level and you really don't want to be before that because what it does is it represents um, uh, the special operations community and how they're trained. And we wanted to stay true to that so that we would stay true to the books. Um, mm-hmm. So, for example, if you're going into uh, to be uh, somebody, say, the 75th Ranger Regiment, um, you don't go to basic training and then jump right into that unit. Uh, there's a selection process. You have to go through basic training, advanced training for, to be an infantryman or whatever you're going to be doing. Then you go to airborne school. Then you go through a selection process called RASP where they basically teach you the job. Mm-hmm. And that could be up to several months. So by the time you're done and you actually get to that unit, most people have already spent a year or more in their unit um, working the job every day. Mm-hmm. So... Um, we wanted to represent that time spent with like that really heavy operator skill. So the operator class would be like your Ranger, uh, your SEAL, MARSOC Raider, um, Marine Corps uh, Reconnaissance Battalion guys, mm-hmm. um, uh, uh, special uh, special warfare, warfare combat crewmen. There, I can speak it to English. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's all these guys that, that, really tap a trigger um, and come from multiple backgrounds, which is why we wanted this at like the third level. Mm -hmm. So like, for example, say you're a combat engineer and you start out with that blasting and and blowing and and knocking down walls, right? And building fortifications. And then you decide to become an operator, right? Now you, you not only have that original training, but you also now have the operator training um, that makes you kind of, as dangerous but at the same time um it it shows that uh it it really reflects that the special operations community comes from multiple roles Mm -hmm. you're not just walking out of basic training and now you're an operator Mm -hmm. and the the last one that i'd want i'd want to go into is is the specialist and i i think what's important to cover is is not what not just what it brings to the table, but how it differentiates from the operators, since both of them ha- both of them need to f- require um, three levels before you can even get into them. Correct. So um, this is this has to do with um, uh, what we call strap hangers, um, and a lot of times it's um, uh, a unit of special operators isn't just guys who pull a trigger. Mm-hmm. Um, they have people that that work with them that are part of the unit they're considered every bit as good and as as uh every bit as important as those guys who pull the trigger but these are guys with very specialized skill and because of that they they don't necessarily have the uh the combat ability but what they bring to the table multiplies their combat ability so for Mm -hmm. example um (laughs) excuse me the uh the special operations combat medic right? Uh, This is a guy that's going to be able to basically do field surgery on you um, while the bullets are flying. Um, Or you have the drone jockey. You know, uh, this guy, you're not going to be surprised. And if you need air support, he can basically grab his Xbox controller and guide in, 
you know, basically like uh, like really big uh, machine guns or bombs or whatever from mm-hmm. a drone overhead. Um, uh, the best example of uh, I usually give of these guys are um, uh, it's a new career field within the last 10 years. It's called an EWO. It's an electronic warfare operator. Mm-hmm. Um, these are guys who uh, are not only experts in communication, but also in terminating that communication so that things like uh, improvised explosives or what have you can't detonate on the guys who are working uh, the trigger up front. Mm-hmm. So um, the these guys are like the ultimate combat multiplier. And if I had to... Um, if I had to equate this to a uh, to a uh, like a Dungeons and Dragons style class, this would be your wizard, uh, because they just they, they once they start getting high level and they start getting to that point where the skills really start adding up and the bonuses start really adding up, they really multiply the guys in the front, you know, beating on shields and uh, you know, leveling grenades. Mm-hmm. Um. I remember when I was looking through the specialist, what I was what I was personally being reminded of, especially with things like rally and coordinating attack and coordinate attack, is the warlord class that was in that was in fourth, and the mar- and the martial class that was in um, third. Right on. Um, and I know I know for some it's blasphemy that I'm bringing up fourth edition, but I'll start <laughs> I'll start hating on it when the checks clear, and so far the checks haven't cleared. Right on. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it, but just that, just that concept of of the of the fr- of the frontline commander, someone yep. who, um, or frontline commander or co- or coordinator, just se- just seems to be the, um, perfect analog. There was after the ca- after the campaign, there was one other that was added at as a um, add on in an update that I did want to cover, and that is yep. the. Um, forward observer or scout. Yep. So this is um, these guys get a lot of hate. <laughs> it's really funny, um, you know, because um, most of the time in a modern military unit, these guys are um, these guys are mechanized, so they they run in vehicles. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we all run in vehicles these days. But I mean, the uh, the these guys get a lot of hate because you know they walk around saying stuff like, you know, we're practically infantry. <laughs> um, and it's like, yeah, um, I don't have a motor uh, carrying the 112 pounds on my back or the 64 pounds of armor, weapons, and ammunition and water that I'm carrying on my body. <laughs> so uh, yet yeah, no. Uh, but they they fill a very particular role in that, um, much like the drone operator, they're the guy that's up front and staying hidden and calling in indirect fire or they're calling in... Um, updates back to the uh, the guys that are um basically relying on the information they they uh convey in in a dnd style game these would be your spies mm-hmm. um uh, and they're 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 uh they're very big combat multipliers uh and real quick what i can do is uh some of the classes that you haven't seen yet mm-hmm. um so we have a class called the uh the special agent um, this would be a class that would work really heavily with the, uh, the state liaison. Mm-hmm. And, uh, it's, it's, it's a very highly customizable class right out of the gate. Mm-hmm. It's another one that comes in at third level. Um, and it allows you to replicate stuff like, um, the CIA's special activities division, mm-hmm. um, uh, the, uh, DEA's, um, uh, forward deployed, uh, ground troops. Um, you could, uh, do spies with this you could do like any number of things mm-hmm. um, so you got that coming in uh, you got the pilot which um, in the later books of the Forgotten Ruin series we start seeing uh, an air cavalry unit show up mm-hmm. um, so uh, we included those as well yeah. um, and you know there's a couple of others here and there uh, but then we also um, we also have a section that if you wanted to play the other side of the table mm-hmm. Um, where a military unit comes into, say, Greyhawk, mm-hmm. and you have a paladin, a cleric, a wizard, and a thief, right? Mm-hmm. There's there's rules for bringing that in and, and how to uh, how to kind of uh, uh, run that at the table instead of playing the military side. Yeah. So yeah, it's it's it, it's been a lot of fun, and the play tests have been fantastic. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's really really cool. 
Now, I know you mentioned the various selector level levers. Um, mm -hmm. One thing, because of how many selector levers there there potentially are, I'm curious if you are put if you plan on putting in a summary sheet to help to help the GM kind of track what sort of things are modified for their particular campaign. I know Genesis has their campaign sheet that does something similar. Yeah, that wouldn't be too hard. Um, the The majority of it has to do with weaponry. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, um, uh, if you're on the, I'm just trying to find it right here. Uh, this goes goes back to uh, us talking beforehand before you hit the button. It's like, are you going to put in uh, bookmarks? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so yes, the bookmarks are coming. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't we didn't put it in the um, in the playtest document because what we wanted was we wanted people to look through the book mm -hmm. um, and get familiar with the book uh, so that uh, because uh, for a playtest document is 96 pages. Mm -hmm. Um, so there was plenty in there to get you going right away. And we wanted to make sure that people read through everything so that at the end of the day, um, the questions you did ask was stuff that definitely wasn't in there. So for example, the grinder, mm -hmm. um, this is standard sword and wizardry white box, right? So you really don't need a tracking sheet for that because everything is either two dice. It's either a D 20 or a D six, and it mm -hmm. makes it very, very simple. Yeah. Um, the pipe hitter is where it starts getting um, a little bit interesting. Um, so you start turning uh, the white box into more like uh, first edition uh, AD&D. Mm -hmm. So um, instead of D6 for hit points, most characters get D8. And then the operators and special forces guys get D10. Um but then what happens is the weapons are also increased. So like um, the uh, the modern military rifle, the military carbine. Um, so that's going to be your M4, your Mark, I uh, Mark 18, uh, your M4 SOP mod, you know, the basic military rifle you see in all the movies. Mm -hmm. um, in the basic game, the grinder, that's 2D6. Done. Mm -hmm. Easy. Nothing else to mess with. Uh, when, you, when you go up to pipe hitter, uh, that uh, becomes, I believe it's 2d6 plus a number, right? But then you, like, you get into the bigger rifles, uh, whereas uh, the machine guns are usually 2d6 per round. Um, the, uh, the uh, what do you call it? The uh, machine guns on the pipe header side are 2d10 per round, right? So you're reflecting the much bigger caliber and the, uh, the higher rate of fire. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, you get your violence of action, uh, selector level level. Um, and that's going to be like your 1990s action movies like Commando and, and weird stuff like that uh, where everybody's walking away from explosions in slow motion. Mm -hmm. um, that's going to be uh, 1D10 uh, for, the, uh, for the basic guys and then 1D12 for the special operators. Uh, and then the weapons are obviously that higher level. Um, but that that's if you if you're looking for more of like a if you're looking for more of that like superhero Arnold Schwarzenegger experience, mm -hmm. you know, um, we've tried it. We play tested it. It was funny for one session. It got boring pretty quick after that. Yeah. Uh, for me, per, for me personally, I wouldn't I I'd probably I'd probably lean I'd probably lean a little bit less a little further away from from um Arnie in the in that kind of situation and lean yeah. more, and lean, um and and lean more and lean more into uh, into other into other films um yeah I um so I know I know that with some of my players that the temptation would be to lean a little bit into John Wick which I could certain I can certainly do I've done it before that would be that middle selector lever that would be like the pipe hitter mm -hmm. um. The, we feel that uh, with the standard version of the game, uh, which is the uh, you know the Operation White Box version, mm -hmm. um, that that particular version of the game works very very well at the lowest setting, which is the grinder. Um, mm -hmm. You get one d six for hit points, and everything's in base in, in versions of of d six. Mm -hmm. uh, the benefit uh, is you are more soft soft and squishy. So people have a tendency to start using tactics, which is what military guys do, because mm -hmm. once you take away the armor, um, uh, 
getting shot still sucks for you just as bad as it does for anybody else. Mm -hmm. So um, the things th that the game is set up for, like laying down suppressive fire, the capability of, of doing an L-shaped ambush, react to contact, like all that stuff that's in the rules, um, it, it works well at that setting because you realize that you're not a Superman. If mm -hmm. you get shot, you're done. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so uh, it works best at that lowest setting. Although if you did want the John Wick experience, that pipe hitter, um, mm -hmm. we played a six session play test of that and everybody had a great time. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, um, there's uh, in the more complete rules that you guys are going to be getting once we have a little more art. Um, uh, there's rules for uh, augmenting the monsters at w as well so that they are doing slightly more. Mm -hmm. um, and then like an alternative to hit points. Yeah. Uh, so Inci yeah, from there. <laughs> Incidentally, ahead. I did get a bit of a chuckle that the grinder mode, even a bad MRE could take someone out, which yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I've been, I've been sent a few, I've been sent a few, a few MREs. Um, I, I put, I put someone's name in the book of grudges because they sent, because they sent me a veggie omelet MRE. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. No bueno. <laughs> That's um, the worst one. <laughs> That that's what it, that's everybody told me that the veggie omelet was the worst one that I shouldn't eat it <laughs> when I when it got sent to me and and I was like I know people said it but I got it but I gotta see for myself if that's the case and then yep. afterwards it was like okay you win <laughs> yeah absolutely um, uh... and I've although the um the I remember I remember also getting the a hamburger one which. I didn't even use as I was supposed to. I just, I just broke I just broke everything apart and then and then and then and then find and then uh, mixed it with gravy from a nut from another MRE. Yeah, <laughs> the, 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 I don't think that I had that one. That was one I missed. Yeah. Um, we uh, for a while, my unit had uh, some of the test stuff in the in like the wave two, that was getting away from like those first generations of MRE, but. Mm -hmm. um, uh, like some of the the really goofy stuff, like people had uh, like um, uh, carne asada tortilla with you know fluffy <laughs> rice. I'm like, what? <laughs> because I, because nothing said nothing says let's sur let's survive out in the middle of nowhere, <laughs> like blowing out your anus. Oh my god! <laughs> I was like, how are you going to eat that and not explode? But that, you know, and, oh god. I feel I feel bad for anybody who had to get who had to get something like that with say um, Crucible. <laughs> yeah, it's just no bueno. You you're, know, so. you're supposed to you expect me to you expect someone to make that kind of thing last. Exactly, <laughs> you know. But each one of those uh, contain just just one of those contains a uh, more than a day's worth of calories. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it's just like. Oof. No, no, I'm all, I'm all set. I'm gonna keep my tacos on the taco truck where they belong. Yeah, um, I get the feeling it was a case where a, bu or a bunch of people, a bunch of people asked for some variety in the MRE and th and then regretted that decision. They had a chow mein one for a little while. And what? We were just like, <laughs> yeah, we were like, this oh. is not good, bro. I'm can. I'm perplexed on two things. One, the idea of doing chow, the idea of doing chow mein in an MRE, um, which, with with all with all the um, all that that entails, and two, trying to get that to actually put together and and work. Yeah, I was not a big fan. I I can imagine. Um, I think I'm pretty sure there's some people I know who would probably probably rather take KP than <laughs> than eat one of those. You know, um, uh, the deployments that I went on, you know, everybody busts my chops because uh, when I talk about the deployments, I usually talk about the food. Mm -hmm. And they're just like, dude, you're always talking about the food. It's because I never ate the MREs when, I, when it was possible. Mm -hmm. You know, um, if we were dealing with an indigenous population, I would eat what they eat. And um, I was, I think I was much healthier for it. <laughs> um, Probably. You know. You're, uh, much less, you're much less miserable for it. Oh my God! You know, you'd have uh, when I was working in Iraq, uh, we were working with some of the locals, and they uh, they were like, uh, "Hey, can we borrow that big giant chopper knife you have on your on your on your pack?" And I I was like, uh, "Well, you know, this is uh, somebody made this for me, and I'm kind of attached to it." They're like, "No, we're gonna bring it back. Um, we have a sheep we're gonna butcher for dinner tonight." 
I was like, oh, right on. So there was meat right from the farm to table that saw zero um, like pesticides or antibiotics or, you know, like craziness, Mm -hmm. you know, Um, it had been walking around earlier that day. And then it was, it was on the stove that night, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so, uh, but yeah, the, uh, in the grinder level of the game, yeah, a bad MRE could take you out if you're not careful. (laughs) So, um, but you know, there's, there's plenty of other stuff that could take you out at low Mm -hmm. level as well, because, you know, the game has things like curses and, yeah. and really dark magic. So mm-hmm. if you're not careful, you're going to have a bad day at the office. Yeah, and even even beyond that, oh, I've al- I've always I've always warned people to be to be extremely ca- to be extremely careful what they eat when they're out camping or the like because I've I've had my fair share of horror stories of somebody eat of somebody um eat of somebody eating the wrong thing or thinking that because they saw some berries that they're edible and then they learn that that's not the case? You know, if they're lucky, um, they're going to have a case of uh, dysentery or diarrhea. If they're not lucky, um, you could get all sorts of intestinal parasites. There's mm-hmm. um, there, some of the uh, some of the poisonous, or, uh, some of the berries and, and mushrooms out there are poisonous. Mm-hmm. Um, they Some of them have narcotic effects. So you have to be careful. You, oh, yeah. you really do. And I'd imagine that even it, even the even the flora in a in a fantasy setting is no, is no different. You got to be very very careful about about how, about exactly how you're going to try the whole live off the land thing. Exactly. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, and uh, you see that a little bit in the first book, mm-hmm. uh, in, the, in the first novel that the game was based off of. Yeah. You know, you see that not everything here is is friendly. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Yeah. So, for, if I need to use a real world example, folks, think of Australia, <laughs> you know, where ev- where everything wants to kill you. Oh my God! Yeah, it's like Australia on crack. <laughs> um, uh, I sp- there's there's a reason there's a reason why so many so many of those so many of those old folk tales f- that originated in Eastern Europe always dealt with forests. Yep, it's uh, true. And for me personally. Growing up, I was more scared of werewolves than I was of vampires. As weird as that sounds. <laughs> Did you live close to a like a big forest? Yes. Yeah, that, that'll do it. <laughs> I not only not only that, but um, my family my family is a bunch of camping and fishing nuts. My re- my grandfather was on was on the Minnesota Trout Association. Oh, right on. And fi- the fishing opener is treated is treated like a state holiday. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> It's not an official state holiday, but it may as well be. With I remember, I remember going past um, convenience stores and the like, and seeing these long ass lines where people were trying to get their fishing licenses. Dear Lord, <laughs> um, I think it's also the reason I was never as squeamish when it came to dissection in high school because I had already le- I had already known how to fillet a fish. Oh, right on. Yeah, um, most you of the clean most, it. Yeah, you got you got to clean it and. Um, it's also what made me develop a burning hatred for Northern Pike. Because <laughs> no matter how hard, no matter how much you clean it, some bone is going to get in that. Yep, it's true. Oh. but I know that the playtest document was ninety-six pages. What are you shooting for as far as a page count for the full book? So it's probably originally it was going to be close to. Um, uh, between 250 and 300 pages, mm-hmm. um, but that was before um, the uh, stretch goal to get the deluxe hardcover. So um, originally, the plan was to develop this. Um, there's a thing in the army called a leader book, mm-hmm. and we usually uh, it comes in like two varieties. Um, if you're like, uh, if you really don't care what you carry in your pocket, pocket, there's this like nine by six hardcover journal that all the sergeants carry. Um, but if you're a guy that spends a lot of time around water, like uh, Marine Corps reconnaissance, Rangers, uh, some of the paratroopers, uh, definitely the Navy guys, uh, they have uh, something in the same thing, but it's like a right in the rain mm-hmm. uh, notebook where it, it'll withstand water. Um, originally, the plan was to make it that size to mimic the exact books that these military personnel are carrying. Mm-hmm. Um when the stretch goal was funded for the deluxe hardcover, we decided to go to the standard. Um, it's something like 10.81 by uh, 
point six or something like that. It's the standard like hardcover that we've had on all the old D and D books with the orange spine and all that and that jazz. So that brought the page count down because it's a much bigger page, so we could fit more on it. Uh, the benefit of that um, of having the bigger book. Um, is that um, the artist that we have for a lot of the uh, incredible art that we're seeing is uh, John Gibbons. Mm -hmm. John's artwork is like um, if you took a Michael Bay film and uh, splashed it with ink. Mm -hmm. It's it's really tremendous. Um, he just turned in a piece the other day, and I'm just like, oh, my God, this needs to be a poster. Um so yeah, uh, probably anywhere between 150 to 225. I would I would guess mm -hmm. uh, for the uh, for the document once it's all said and done. Um, uh, we'll probably use font that people can read, <laughs> so yeah. it'll be a little bit bigger. Mm -hmm. um, as I do to... I do hope that the that the um, scratched as asides th throughout the book are kept because I love that bit of humor. Oh, did you did you really? Yeah, it was. Uh, um, that was used to reflect the uh, the novels. Um, mm -hmm. The main character in the novels is uh, this guy named Talker. Um, he is an army translator assigned to um, a ranger unit. And uh, they kind of uh, force him, sort of voluntold him to be the, uh, the chronicler for everything. They want him to write everything down. Mm -hmm. So, like, periodically when he's letting people read his account of things, they write stuff in the margins. Mm -hmm. So um, we, we kind of kept that, and we kind of wanted to go with that uh, because it was so much fun in the books. Um, uh, like, for example, one of the pages when it goes into the personal combat section of the, uh, uh, the, the playtest document, there's a picture of two operators and a military working dog standing side by side with, uh, like, a skeletal warrior. Um, and the, uh, the sideline, like somebody wrote in pen, it says, my dog would have been like, got any snacks with you, bro. <laughs> <laughs> so like stuff like that, uh, we, we, we might keep it, um, or, um, we're, we're going to have to, we'll talk to the layout guy and see, uh, how it, how it's going to play out because yeah. what we want to do is we want to make sure that, um, this thing looks as good in print as we can make it. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, the downside would have been like, if there's, uh, if there's something that's scrawled off the page and something's got to get cut, you know, we don't want to, we, we, we don't want to limit people's experience because of, um, how a machine will cut the, the print run. So, uh, we'll have to wait to see how the layout guide determines that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I will be looking forward to that. Um, but with all that said, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness at play here. <laughs> oh, thanks for having me. It was a good time. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open, whether it's to <laughs> further cover forgotten ruin or just to just to la just to laugh and argue about 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 the um about things as silly as say the um new, the new weapon trials that a few of my colleagues have been discussing. Weapon trials in what way? <laughs> Are you talking to the army? Yeah. Oh, the the new army rifle. Yeah. MGX spear. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> love and hate. Um, the the new army guys really love it because it's new and sexy. Uh, the special operators have already said they don't want to use it because it's too damn big. <laughs> yeah, I've um, I've it's all it's always it's always interesting seeing seeing the seeing the relationship between what the customer says they want versus what they want when they actually get it. Yeah. <laughs> but that but um as I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> exactly. Hey, and, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Yep. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the Good Brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>